Good evening and welcome to Talk It Over. I have a very honored and a very special guest with me, Mr. Vernon E. Jordan, who is the national president of the Urban League. He has been serving in that capacity since 1972. He is also uh, an author of a uh, newspaper column, To Be Equal, which is read in 600 newspapers around the country. And if that isn't enough, he has a three times weekly radio program on the Westinghouse Group W broadcast. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to be in the warm weather. <laughs> what is the Urban League? What does it do? The Urban League is a um, civil rights community-based service delivery agency. We've been in business since 1910, founded one year. After our sister organization, the NAACP, we were both founded in New York. Urban League came into being precisely to be of assistance in New York City and then in cities around the country to facilitate black people as they migrated to New York City, to the north, from plantations and rural areas in the south, and to assist them with the economic, social, and political adjustment to that new urban environment. Uh, in that 68-year period, we have been basically about four things. Advocacy, the delivery of direct services, uh, the bringing together of people, black and white, and rich and poor, and old and young, the public sector and the private sector, and also about the open, pluralistic, integrated society as being consistent with what we believe democracy to be all about. Following up on that last question, how do you feel about our integrated society? Are we an integrated society? Well, no, we're not an integrated society. Um, we have made a faint effort at it. Uh, we now have, it seems to me, a body of law uh, in which the integrated society can in fact take place. That has not happened. It is still a myth. It is not yet a reality. Uh, but it seems to me that that concept of the open, pluralistic, integrated society is consistent with the uh, basic foundations of this country. What would have to happen in this country for you to say we now have an integrated society? Well, I think first of all we begin by uh, eliminating all of the vestiges of, of racism in this society uh, by eliminating the uh, attitudinal problem that the majority community has as relates to the minority community, the, the reaction, the sensory perceptions that are immediately uh, uh, come to fore by, the virtue, by virtue of the presence uh, of a black, uh, and then to make our institutions uh, void and free of the historic institutional racism that we all find ourselves victims of. We'll be right back with Mr. Vernon E. Jordan, President of the National Urban League. One of the things that comes to mind um, is President Carter's anti-inflation campaign. Uh, asking us all to tighten our belts, to hold everything down to 7%, no new government spending. How does that affect the black community? Well, it affects us disproportionately. We are already in a belt tightening situation. Uh, we are already uh, uh, in a depressed uh, recessionary situation. And to ask those at the bottom of the heap, those who uh, on the margins of, of the society to, to bear in a further burden, it seems to me, is not to understand the historic, the historic neglect that black people, Hispanics, and other minorities have suffered uh, in this society. I, I am uh, basically in agreement with the voluntary aspect of the President's inflationary program. Uh, as it relates to government spending, I'm disappointed that in his effort to check inflation, that he does not in equate the problem of inflation, inflation with the problem of unemployment. I think that the problems are not mutually exclusive. I think that they are 
twin concerns. We've seen in this country double-digit inflation and double-digit unemployment. Uh, we've also seen a reduction in inflation and a reduction in, in unemployment. I think that what we have to have in this society is a, is a full employment economy. Everybody working at a decent job at a decent wage rather than the traditional uh, uses of economic restraint, tight money, cutbacks on government spending, uh, raising of the interest rates. Uh, that is asking uh, those who already bear a disproportionate burden in our economy to bear even more. Uh, there's a notion that uh, uh, the economy is going into recession and, and black people really have not recovered uh, from the recession that we had uh, several years ago. What figure inflation would be acceptable to you if we could have full employment to go with it? Oh, I think that that's a difficult question to ask as to what figure would be acceptable. I want as little inflation as possible because ultimately uh, inflation is, is, a, is a negative for everybody in the society. I do not believe on the other hand that uh, you, you pass a tax bill that, that benefits the wealthy, uh, as we saw in the country and the, and the Congress this year, uh, and then uh, at the same time ask those at the bottom of the heap to, to bear an even heavier burden. If you would look at where the uh, inflation is really lodged, it is in fuel, it is in energy, it is in health, and it is in housing. Those are essentials uh, uh, where Poor people have no choice. They have no margin. They, 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 you cannot decide uh, not to buy food this week as opposed to not going to ski this week. Uh, poor people do not have that option. They have to keep warm. They have to eat. Uh, they have to have a roof over their heads. Uh, uh, and that, that's a problem. I do not believe that uh, uh, you can ask black people and poor people to bear that burden. There was another problem that few people realize as relates to the, uh, uh, the situation as it relates to government spending, and that is that, that what we have in America right now in the black community, to the extent that we have a middle class, it is a public sector middle class. Uh, we've not really pierced the corporate veil and the private sector to the point that that is where most of us are in the middle class. Most of us are teachers, and, and we work in the post office, and and we work in state, local, and, and federal governmental jobs. So when you're talking about cutting government spending, you're actually getting at uh, uh, the heart of what little middle class advance we have in fact made. What impact has the affirmative action programs had in bringing uh, the black middle class into managerial positions? Oh, well, it's clearly had a positive effect. It's had a lasting effect. Uh, the, if you look at the exempt employees uh, in uh, most companies today, it, it, the range is about 3%. Uh, Ten years ago, 15 years ago, it was, it was minus uh, 3%. Uh, so that is, that is clearly uh, uh, a progressive area. Uh, on the other hand, given the interpretations now that many people are making of the Baca decision, uh, those who have never done anything about affirmative action, those who see no affirmative responsibility of affirmative action, have seized upon Bakke to do, to continue to do nothing. Others who made some progressive moves have, have seized upon the ambiguities of Bakke uh, to, to slow down what little progress they were making. I happen to believe that the Bakke decision was not a defeat for the black community. By the same token, it was not an overwhelming victory for blacks, Hispanics, women, or other poor people. Uh, it did, on the other hand, reaffirm the notion that uh, affirmative action is deeply embedded in the fabric of our law, and the court did not overturn that. Speaking of affirmative action and women, one frequently hears the comment among feminists, and particularly black feminists, that um, the black man is interested in job equality insofar as it relates to him, but as far as it relates to women and black women, um, once he's got his, his uh, handle on society. Yeah, I don't know what black feminists you've been talking to, but I'm not, uh, <laughs> I've not heard that contention. Uh, there is some problem 
not sufficiently documented to, to be specific about it, about the extent to which uh, the white feminist movement itself uh, is in fact exclusionary and because... Uh, exclusionary of black feminists or... Both, black men and black women, and uh, white women who have never been in the labor market, who are now 40 years old and are weary of taking the kids to school, the kids have gone off to school, given the educational skills, they're coming back into the market. There is some evidence that that is displacing uh, both black men and black women, given the nature of racism in our society. Uh, that's a general statement. I do not have data uh, yet to back it up. I think there is probably some validity to that. I want to ask you about another minority group. Uh, recently, we've seen figures put out that the Hispanic minority, very shortly, say five years, will be the largest minority in this country, uh, a minority that has not had the leadership that you in the black community have had, Whitney Young, Martin Luther King, there, there are no big names like that in the Hispanic movement. What will that do to the Urban League? And what will that do to the black minority movement? Oh, I do not see the growing numbers of Hispanics in America having a negative impact on, on the needs and aspirations of blacks. I think that it will indeed enhance the need to for all minorities in our society. That there are some differences as it relates to the Hispanic community and the black community. Uh, one is that Hispanics have never been designated as, as black or colored. They've been always included, as I understand it, and, 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 and the overall white population figures. That, that's a big difference. The other difference uh, is that the institutional fabric of the Hispanic community uh, does not have the history uh, does not have the development, doesn't have the financial base uh, that is present in the black community. There is no uh, NAACP that's almost 70 years old or no Urban League that's 69 years old or 100 black colleges that uh, are 100 years old or 100 Hispanic colleges. But that institutional development will come. Uh, I think that the Hispanic community will be a, a minority that this country will long have to contend with that is healthy, I view that as positive. I do not view that as threatening to anything that the black community would want to do in this society. Okay. We'll be right back. I noticed on your list of credits that you are a director of the American Express Company, Bankers Trust, JCPenney, Xerox, Selenese Corporation. Um, are you the token black? Do you have a part in, the, in those meetings? What do you do with all those big heads of of uh, big industry in this country. I do what the rest of them do. I make policy. I participate uh, in the deliberations as anybody else. There is nothing in the laws of incorporation of any company on which I serve that, that says a director has to be anything other than uh, one who has responsibilities and obligations uh, to the shareholders and to the corporate entity. Uh, there is nothing in the laws of incorporation that talks about white directors or black directors. So I'm not a black director, I'm not a white director, I am a director with all of the rights, responsibilities, and privileges thereunto pertaining. Uh, I do not view myself at 237 pounds and six feet four and a half as token. <laughs> That's an excellent answer. Um, do you find yourself sitting on these boards uh, speaking of employment and job opportunities and, and outreach for uh, new employees into the ghettos, et cetera? Are well, I clearly have an interest in that uh, based on what I do every day and based on my blackness and based on my experience as a black man in this society. Uh, and I have a clear interest in those issues, uh, but I'm also interested in, in what goes on in the audit committee. I'm also interested in the uh, P.E. ratio. I'm also interested in, in the debt to capital ratio. I'm also interested in the day-to-day uh, -day management of the, of, the, of the company. I'm interested in its, uh, in its margins and its directors uh, and officers' liability insurance. I'm interested in the whole of the company. I'm not there to plead special interest or a special problem. And to the extent that those problems do 
come up and they do come up, I am as involved as, as, as any other director. Uh, I am not, on the other hand, the equal opportunity officer for the company. I'm a director. Do you have many other black counterparts on the major boards of, of uh, the companies of this country? Uh, are we, in other words, what I'm really asking, is that color line being broken? Well, blacks have clearly, and, and, and women, have clearly pierced the corporate veil. Uh, not to the extent that I think uh, it should be done, but it's clearly better than it was. It was a white male preserve. Uh, that is no longer true. I believe that it is improving. I believe that it is getting better. I have many, many friends, black, whites, and women, who are now participating in this process, who heretofore, uh, for one reason or other, would have been excluded from that process. Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's healthy, I think it's creative, and I think that the society as a whole will benefit from this wider participation in the uh, policy making of American companies. I'd like to switch veins on you. What, is, what do you do for fun? What do you do in your spare time? Well, I don't have much spare time, and uh, to the extent that I have a spare time, I try to spend it with family uh, on the tennis court. Uh, but my hobby is working, so that's what I do most of the time. You're one of those American workaholics, eh? Well, I like working. We have two minutes left, and I would like to ask you what your dream for America is. Well, my dream for America is the ultimate realization in my lifetime tomorrow, tonight, of a society free of, of historic notions about people based on color, uh, a society free of continuous disadvantage based on race, a society that allows a person to move and to have his being and to realize his dreams without the boundaries and without the circumventions of race as a factor. Uh, my hope is for the ultimate realization of the open, pluralistic, integrated society uh, where a man is a man, a woman is a woman, uh, based on the uh, very best that they have in them. And it seems to me that if we can achieve that society, then our cities will prosper, that uh, Unemployment will be no more, that affirmative action will, will, will cease to be an issue, and that we will truly be a society of, of equals. We are not today. How old are your children? I have a daughter who is 19 years old, a uh, sophomore at the University of Pennsylvania studying communications. Well, I, th I thought perhaps, let us suppose you had children four and five years old. I do not have children well, four or five years old. Would you, would you feel that by the time they were adults that maybe America could straighten itself out? Well, I'm really interested in seeing it happen in my own lifetime, uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, uh, I've seen America change. I've participated in some of that change. It is clearly not the society that I grew up in in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, many years ago, uh, having witnessed and experienced and been a part of the change, I have some confidence that we will continue to change and hopefully for the better. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Mr. Vernon E. Jordan, who is the national president of the Urban League and a leader of our country. Thank you for being with me. Thank you.